Okay, our next speaker is uh, Mary Angela Lasanti from Princeton, and we're happy to have her talk to us about the search for dark matter in the gamma ray sky. Thank you, and I want to thank the organizers very much for a wonderful meeting and for the invitation to, to be here today. Um, so I'm going to talk today um, about uh, searches for dark matter in gamma rays, um, and specifically I'm going to be focusing on the scenarios of dark matter annihilation. Um, and what I'm going to do over the course of the talk is just kind of take you through all the different places that we've been looking in the gamma ray sky uh, for these signals. So the types of dark matter particles that we're focusing on in this case um, fall in the category of thermal dark matter. Um, so in these kinds of scenarios, you have two dark matter particles that are, uh, can interact with each other in the very early universe. Uh, they annihilate to give you two standard model states, and then the reverse uh, interaction can also occur. So this is an equilibrium process that's happening in the early universe, and it continues um, until uh, the uh, dark matter particles can no longer find each other, um, and that happens when the, um, the expansion rate becomes uh, faster than the annihilation rate for this interaction. Uh, and when that occurs, this forward reaction shuts off, and the dark matter density essentially remains constant and is approximately the value that we observe today. Um, so we can, there we go. Uh, so what we can do is just do a back of the envelope estimate to figure out what kinds of properties of the dark matter particles give us the, the observed abundance that we see. Uh, and so as I've written out up here, this is the dark matter density and this is its annihilation cross section. So it scales inversely with that annihilation cross section. And then I can write out this annihilation cross-section in terms of the dark matter mass, uh, m chi, as well as its uh, coupling constant to the standard model, uh, alpha. And you can see that in order to recover the measured abundance, so where uh, the dark matter density is roughly 0.1, coming from Planck and W map, uh, we get that if the dark matter mass is roughly 100 GeV and its coupling strength is roughly weak scale. Uh, so this class of particles is referred to as weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs. It's formed the dominant paradigm for dark matter searches over the last few decades. Uh, and it's really, I mean, I can't kind of stress enough, it's really provided a lamppost for all of these different kinds of searches. Now, in the last few years, uh, there's been a lot of really interesting theoretical work showing that, uh, you know, very small alterations on this simple picture can actually broaden the, the mass range that's allowed for thermal dark matter, uh, taking you all the way down to KEV masses. It's a very exciting new direction. Um, in order to probe those kinds of dark matter particles, you need new kinds of experiments, new types of observations. I'm not gonna have time to delve into that today, but I did wanna mention it because it's, uh, it's just, it's a very, a new direction that, that's um, been gaining speed over the last few years. So if we do focus on this uh, picture of WIMPs, then um, we have this, you know, this simple picture of dark matter annihilations. And um, while they occur today, they're very rare. And so the challenge is to try to pick them out uh, from observations that we make in the sky. Uh, we can increase our chances of observing these kinds of self-annihilations if we look in regions that have very high dark matter density, which are essentially the centers of galaxies. Uh, and one point I do want to emphasize is that a detection uh, of this uh, annihilation event is essentially a, the most direct way of probing the thermal uh, hypothesis because it's these same interactions that we would be observing today that essentially set the abundance of the dark matter in the early universe. So what do we actually look for? Um, it depends on what the dark matter annihilates into. So in one case, we can have the dark matter annihilate directly into photons, as uh, that's shown here. Uh, and in this scenario, the energy of the photon is just the mass of the dark matter particle. So if you're looking for a signal in the sky uh, where you're counting up number of photons that you see as a function of their energy, the background would be some you know, falling, falling background, and your signal would be some peak that's located right at the dark matter mass. And while this is a very kind of dramatic uh, observable, um, seeing something like a delta function located right at the dark matter mass, these types of uh, diagrams tend to be suppressed in terms of overall rate um, in the most typical kinds of models. And so what you typically end up getting uh, more of are scenarios where the dark matter will annihilate to W bosons or Zs or quarks or something like that. 
Uh, and where the photons come from is these standard model states shower, they produce the photons in that showering, so you get pions, those pions will decay. Uh, and so in that process, you get photons, but the energies of the photons get smeared out. Uh, and so you still see an excess, but that excess is now broadened uh, and looks more like a continuum excess. So when you calculate what the annihilation rate should be for a dark matter particle, it depends both on its particle physics properties as well as its astrophysics properties. Uh, on the particle physics side, um, things that factor in are its cross-section, uh, its mass, uh, the number of photons you expect to get in that showering process. Uh, and then on the astrophysics side, uh, it's the dark matter density squared. Uh, and this term here, uh, the part that's the integral over the dark matter density squared is referred to as the J factor. I'm going to make reference to that over the course of the talk. So there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of what this density actually is. Uh, from n-body simulations, it looks like fairly universally we end up getting what's called an NFW profile. So that's shown here by this red line. This is density as a function of distance from the center of a galaxy. And the NFW profile is just like a double, double falling power law. Uh, however, there's uh, potential evidence that you can have a chord profile. So these are shown here by this uh, dot dash line or this one up here. Uh, so essentially in these chord scenarios, the dark matter density is flattening out as you get closer to the center of the galaxy. Uh, for most of the results I'll show you the, over the course of this talk, I'm going to be assuming an NFW profile, but you can always reinterpret any of those results in terms of any of these other profiles. It's a, it's a general kind of systematic uncertainty that kind of goes along with us. So we're very fortunate because we have a tremendous, uh, tremendously good data to play with uh, to look for these dark matter interactions. And to kind of give you a sense of the perspective of how far uh, things have, have improved over the last few decades. Um, this is uh, an image, uh, the first image of the extragalactic background taken from the OSO3 satellite in the 1960s. Uh, if we progress through the 1990s, here's Egret looking in the energy range from 30 MeV to 30 GeV. And here's what we have today with Fermi Lat, which was launched in 2008 and has a sensitivity over much wider energy range. And you can see this, this, this beautiful structure that that comes out and the, the resolution is just spectacular. Uh, so when you look at a map like this from Fermi, um, what's actually there? What are all of the features? Uh, so in the dominant source of gamma rays here is just coming from diffuse cosmic ray emission. And um, there's three processes that are dominating that. So the first is uh, Bremsstrahlung. So this is where if you have high energy electrons passing by uh, interstellar gas, you get emission of high energy photons. You can have photons from boosted pion decay. Uh, you can also have upscattering of photons from CMB or interstellar radiation field photons. Um, these two scenarios tend to be correlated with the gas distribution, which is why in these small little simulated images, you see that the emission tends to kind of trace the, the gas uh, near the, the galactic plane, and in contrast, inverse Compton is more uniformly distributed on the sky. So in this map here, most of these photons that we see are actually correlated with this diffuse emission, um, and in particular, uh, when we look at the galactic plane. Um, but there's other things that uh, are happening here. Uh, you can, if you squint, see the, the bottom lobe here and the top lobe for the Fermi bubbles. Um, you can see bright spots. Uh, these are resolved point sources. Uh, Fermi provides a catalog of these. Um, you can, this is an arrow pointing to just the general sky here, but all of the sources outside our own galaxy are, are you know, that emit in gamma will be end up contributing kind of like an isotropic emission across the, the entire sky. So in this, uh, image that I showed on the last slide, um, amongst all of these different astrophysical processes that we see here, we want to be picking out a dark matter signal. Um, and the challenge is the dark matter signal is going to be a lot smaller than anything else that's, that we see here. Um, so in order to maximize our ability to pick something out, we're going to want to look in regions that we think are going to be highly uh, dark matter dominated. And so for the rest of the talk, what I want to do is essentially take you on um, a tour of all of these locations that we can look at and summarize what we've learned about dark matter from each of these places. So I'm going to start in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, primarily because it's the brightest 
uh, source of dark matter that we can look at. Um, and uh, so we're going to start in the, the center of our Milky Way, and then we're going to move our way out. So starting in our own Milky Way, the uh, story immediately gets very interesting. Um, so in 2009 and 2010, in these papers by um, Hooper and Goodenough, uh, there was a first indication that there's an excess of GeV gamma rays in the center of the galaxy. Um, you can see that in these series of images here, each box is a different energy range, so 0.5 to 1, 1 to 3, 3 to 10, and 10 to 50. Uh, the black areas are masked out in the analysis, and you see this residual excess as this kind of bright spot in the middle. Um, since these initial papers, there have been a whole variety of studies that have confirmed um, this excess. In general, um, the properties are that it's spherically symmetric. Uh, it extends out to roughly 10 degrees. It constitutes a large fraction of the flux, so about 10% of the total flux in the inner galaxy, and it's a fairly high statistical significance. Um, and people got really excited about this because a lot of features about this excess are reminiscent of what you would expect for dark matter. Um, so for, in particular, uh, the energy spectrum uh, can be fit well by a dark matter. So here's the uh, energy of the, the photons in this gamma ray excess. Uh, the data are the points here, and a best fit dark matter model is the, the solid line. Um, and the, on here, it's showing the best fit mass and cross section. So if we assume that the dark matter goes to uh, B quarks in its final state, you can explain this excess by a 30 GeV particle uh, roughly with thermal annihilation cross section. Um, so that's very appealing. Both the, the energy distribution and spatial morphology are consistent with what you might want to get from, from dark matter. And then in addition, um, a lot of the, these features appear to be robust to, to um, changes in diffuse emission modeling. Um, another possibility uh, is that uh, this excess could be explained by unresolved sources. So one popular candidate are millisecond pulsars. Um, in this image here, uh, this is a simulation of a millisecond pulsar population in the center of the galaxy. And um, you can see that these, these objects would be so faint that even if you have a, a variety of them, um, they would be unresolved and just kind of look like an amorphous blob in the center. Um, so you wouldn't actually be able to pick out each individual uh, pulsar in, in this. Um, and so being able to distinguish, uh, say, a population of these unresolved sources from uh, a dark matter signal would be, you know, is just challenging just because in some sense they look really similar um, by eye when you look at this, this map. Um, to, to try to piece this out, this was work from a few years ago with Ben Safdie and Samuel Lee. Uh, we had uh, developed this analysis procedure that allows you to tell the difference between having um, a collection of point sources that are unresolved and a smooth distribution of photons. Um, and the, the method is just relies on sort of simple image processing um, methods. And um, it's I'm going to demonstrate it here with this very simple little movie. So uh, on the left is um, a histogram of photon counts in each pixel of a map. So you can just think of this as like a, I'm taking a photograph, and I just go through and I count all of the photons in each pixel of the photograph. And if uh, I have a lot of bright, hot pixels, this histogram extends out to a high tail here. And if I don't have a lot of bright, hot pixels, it falls off more quickly. Um, so as I get this, if it works, there we go. So on the right are sources on the sky. And as the number of sources increases and they correspondingly, correspondingly become less bright, the green here uh, histogram just uh, approaches what you'd expect for the smooth dark matter component. Um, so essentially, we, we built up a statistical procedure that allows you to, to identify whether or not you have tails. In, in this distribution here. And applying that to the center of the galaxy, um, we found that there was uh, the distribution of photons looked more clumpy um, and more reminiscent of an unresolved population of sources than a smooth background, a smooth dark matter component. Um, and then several other groups using different methods. Um, so there was a, using wavelet methods in particular. Um, and then the Fermi collaboration more recently also um, uh, came up with, with similar, similar results. Um, so one possible way of explaining this is um, that these millisecond pulsars have gotten, um, are essentially coming from the disruption of globular clusters as they're falling into the galaxy. Um, so the idea here is that the millisecond pulsars will be born in these globular clusters. Um, these clusters would be spiraling in due to dynamical friction. When they end up in the center of the galaxy, they just dump um, 
what's, you know, their millisecond pulsar is there, and over time this ends up building up a uh, population of sources here. Um, the good news is that with targeted and large area radio surveys in the upcoming years, we should hopefully be able to detect these individual pulsars, and then that would help um, resolve the part of this mystery. It'll either tell us that these sources are, are these MSPs, or if they're not, that, you know, we're going to have to rethink um, what other populations of sources uh, could be contributing. So before leaving the Milky Way, um, I do want to quickly just mention that besides just looking at the center of our own galaxy, we can look at subhalos in the galaxy. So in um, Lambda CDM, we expect that as a halo forms, it also has a bunch of other smaller clumps of uh, bright subhalos in it. So this is from a simulation. Here's the center of the galaxy, and you see these you know, just spectacular little array of subhalos that are all there. Each one of these is a dark matter clump where you can have annihilation, so we can search for this in the Milky Way. Uh, the challenge with this is that um, what would be a, you know, very bright signal if you just uh, had all of these subhalos forming in Lambda CDM, uh, it would look something like this. But in reality, these are subhalos that are, you know, passing through the disk. They're getting tidally stripped as they're merging. And uh, what you end up with after accounting for this tidal stripping is a lot harder to distinguish uh, than, than something like that. So these kinds of searches are, are quite challenging. Um, two different approaches um, are, are being used. So one is to look at the brightest objects that should be surviving and say, okay, well, if they're really bright, Fermi should have seen them and they should be resolved sources. Um, so you can uh, set bounds on dark matter by um, seeing, making sure you don't overpredict the number of bright sources in uh, Fermi's catalog. Um, and the other option that we're exploring now, this is with my students, uh, Laura Chang and Siddharth Misha Sharma, um, is to try to see whether or not we can say anything about the unresolved population of sources using similar methods um, to what we applied in the inner galaxy. All right, so moving out of the Milky Way and starting to kind of pan out a little farther, um, the first place we might want to look outside of our own galaxy is within the local group. Um, and the best sources for uh, dark matter annihilation there would be coming from uh, dwarf galaxies. Uh, and there's been a tremendous amount of progress in identifying dwarfs over the last few years. Um, in particular, uh, with uh, DES, we now nearly doubled the number of dwarf candidates that exist. So we can essentially then look in each of these regions of the sky where we know that there's one of these dark matter dominated systems and see if there's any annihilation. Um, and so these are results from the Fermi collaboration. Um, they're the tightest limits that we have on dark matter. Um, even though these dwarfs are not as bright, intrinsically bright in dark matter annihilation as, let's say, the center of our galaxy, they're much cleaner systems to use because there's less gas and baryons that's there. Um, and so the way to read these kinds of plots is here's the cross section as a function of mass. Um, to guide the eye, this dashed line is indicating the thermal relic cross section. Current limit from the Fermi collaboration dwarf analysis is this black line here. And um, these green and yellow bands are meant to indicate um, just sort of the, the spread you might expect um, if you were to kind of randomly sample the sky. Um, and so the important takeaway is you can see that this line is starting to cross this thermal relic cross-section line um, around 50, 60 GeV. So everything above this line is roughly excluded, right? So this is telling us that with these dwarfs, we're starting to actually probe some regions of parameter space that are highly well motivated for this WIMP, um, in this WIMP scenario. Um, the other point is that these blobs here are best fit regions for the galactic center excess. And you can see that they're in tension with the dwarf results, but not excluded by them. So stepping out even farther, um, when we looked here in the uh, local group, we had about 50 or so of these dwarf galaxies um, that could we could use as uh, dark matter targets. Um, but can we take advantage of the fact that if we look out even farther, we're dealing with thousands of galaxies? And what kinds of sensitivities do those give us when we look for dark matter? So there's been a variety of searches um, looking for extragalactic dark matter. Um, this is just a very brief summary. So these are searches that have either focused on single clusters, galaxy clusters, um, searches requiring that um, dark matter annihilation uh, not overpredict the isotropic gamma ray background, 
and also cross-correlation studies between Fermi maps and um, galaxy, uh, galaxy group catalogs. Um, and in all of these cases, uh, it's probably a little difficult to see, but in all of these cases, um, these limits from the extragalactic searches haven't really uh, pushed down below this thermal, thermal line that's kind of this benchmark. Um, and so they, they've tended to be weaker than the limits coming from, from dwarfs. Um, in the last few minutes, I want to show you some very recent results that we're just finishing up now um, that uh, I think is going to change this picture in the sense that um, we can, it's going to allow us to really be able to take advantage of these extragalactic targets to um, really push the sensitivities on uh, dark matter annihilation. Um, so this is work done in collaboration with uh, Siddharth, uh, Nick Rod, and Ben Safdie. I uh, definitely want to highlight the contributions of Siddharth and Nick, who uh, toiled pretty tirelessly on this. Um, the idea is to essentially start from a galaxy group catalog, use each of those galaxies as essentially seeds for locations in the sky where we expect there to be a dark matter signal, because um, each galaxy group is going to be surrounded by its own dark matter halo. Um, so this is just from simulation. Uh, this is the dark sky simulation. This is a map of the galaxies distributed on the sky. This is zoomed in. Um, the work, all of the work essentially comes in this step here, where starting from this collection of galaxies, we can map that onto uh, a set of halo properties. And once we do that, then we can um, get an estimate of where we expect the, uh, the signal for dark matter to be brightest. Like you can tell that not all of these galaxies are associated with bright spots on this map of J factors. Um, so the actual uh, catalogs that we use come from the two mass redshift survey, um, primarily from two mass, um, supplemented by some other catalogs. So two mass is a nearly all sky near infrared survey that samples 45,000 galaxies out to redshifts of Z of 0.3. Um, and there's been a tremendous amount of uh, uh, advancement with these recent ca group catalogs here where they take the two mass uh, list of galaxies and then determine which ones are actually grouped together in uh, bound, uh, like as bound structures. And then from that infer what the halo mass should be. Um, and so these catalogs um, have come out over the last few years um, and are very comprehensive in terms of mapping out this catalog, uh, this, these group galaxies out to redshifts of 0 .3, uh, 0 0.03, sorry. Um, and so here's a map of the two mass uh, redshift survey. Each speck here is an individual galaxy with a color indicating its distance from us. So uh, purple is closest and red is most far away. So starting from this, uh, and using these group catalogs that kind of bunch this up into uh, the relevant galaxy groups, we can then end up building a, a dark matter sky map, uh, which tells us where on the sky we'd expect the dark matter signal to be brightest. Um, and so I really like this picture because this is essentially like in the perfect world where all of our galaxies were just lit up with dark matter, this is what it would look like. Um, and there's ob you know, objects on here that are really large, like Andromeda, so that's here, and Virgo, but there's other spots here that are, are quite bright, and all of those could potentially be contributing to a dark matter signal. So what our analysis does is essentially stack up the contributions from all of these 500 or so sources um, to get uh, a limit. Um, so this is, again, uh, annihilation cross-section, dark matter mass. Uh, the black line is the limit that we recover using these galaxy groups from, this, uh, from these catalogs. Um, and the green and yellow band, again, are the, the uncertainty from um, randomly distributing these groups on, on the sky. So you can see that our limit here is ducking down below the thermal relic cross-section line, so we have sensitivity um, to uh, this region that's very well motivated by WIMPs. The um, dwarf analysis line is in gray, so um, they're complementary with each other. And um, we're also starting to kind of probe this region that's relevant for, uh, for the GEV excess. Um, and so especially with something like indirect detection searches with the systematic uncertainty, uncertainties can vary a lot depending on the, the objects that you're looking for dark matter. Having a variety of different targets is really important. Um, and so the complementarity of all of these different analyses in this um, in this region here uh, is quite powerful. And I think in the future we'll be able to do things like combine uh, the dwarf analyses with uh, these galaxy groups to get even better, even better bounds. Um, 
Oh, yeah, and so you might see that there's a slight loosening here of the limit. That's actually coming from a little statistical fluctuation in Fornax. Um, it's essentially two photons that have popped up in one single energy bin uh, right, uh, uh, right at the center of where the halo is. And um, if you're wondering, you know, we start off with like 500 of these, of these galaxies, how many are actually dominating and contributing to this bound. This is showing how the, the, the bound increases as you um, increase the number of halos that are stacked together for a dark matter mass of 100 GeV. And so you can see that you get about an order of magnitude improvement from doing the stacking. Most of that improvement comes from adding in the first 10 or so of these groups. Um, and so I've listed up here what these 10 groups are in case, in case you're interested. Um, so this work, uh, one of the main results of this work is that we now have a catalog of extragalactic dark matter targets. So, you know, we have this list of all of these galaxy groups, uh, their associated J factors, masses, concentrations, boost factors, and we're going to be making this public. Um, so there's lots of work that can be done with this, um, looking for, you know, different kinds of dark matter studies and in other wave bands uh, with all of these different targets. Um, so with that, I'm going to conclude and just remind you of where we've been today. We started off in the center of our own galaxy, um, where the search for dark matter has been um, exciting and complicating, um, both because of uh, the potential, um, the excess in the center of our galaxy, and um, the possibility that there might be baryonic, more, more standard astrophysical processes that might be um, uh, contributing there. And then we, we made our way outwards from there, turning to uh, the dwarf galaxies, which um, uh, have been providing some of the, the best bounds on dark matter because they're such clean systems. And then in the last part of the talk, we zoomed out even further, looking at all of the galaxies in, in the nearby universe. And um, with, with the new results that we have, um, the, res the bounds that we're getting are, are quite sensitive from those. And I think a combination of, of these extragalactic bounds and the dwarf bounds um, are really going to be pushing our understanding for, uh, of weakly interacting. Uh, massive particles, um, and it's, I think there's a lot of really exciting work that we can do with the, the catalogs that we now have available. So with that, I'll conclude, and I'm happy to take any, any additional questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that talk. Do we have any questions? I see one back there. Thanks, very nice talk. Um, so for your limits on the extragalactic objects, do you also into, take into account possible uh, non-dark matter related gamma ray emission? Ah, right. yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a, it's an excellent question. Um, so a lot of these systems, so what we do is we start from a galaxy group catalog, we calculate the J factors and we rank them in terms of what the brightest sources are to the least bright source. But a lot of these, um, these clusters, you'd actually expect to have standard emission from cosmic ray processes. And so we have a selection criteria that we apply that um, is essentially trying to find uh, galaxies that have residuals that are inconsistent with dark matter, which can sound scary when I say it like that right off the bat. Um, but essentially, uh, it's not, because we, can, we gain from the fact that we're starting from a thousand of these galaxy groups. So we know roughly, um, we're trying to find which ones of these are giving, um, have residuals that are completely inconsistent with everything else that's there, um, where we know that all of these should be really bright dark matter emitters. So the selection criteria that we use are that um, we don't include galaxy groups if they are near the galactic plane, if they overlap with another halo, if they have significant three sigma gamma ray excesses and those excesses are excluded by uh, other galaxy groups in our analysis. Um, and so uh, the, the criteria we have here, we've performed um, extensive tests. Most of the work really went into this um, to make sure that we wouldn't exclude an actual signal. So we've done extensive tests um, on both mock data and also on the actual data set to make sure that we would be able to recover any, any signals of dark matter that we include in this. Um, and I'll just flash this up here. Um, these are our top six halos uh, ranked by J factor. Um, and the ones that actually end up getting excluded um, by this criteria are indicated here. And the ones that um, are included in the stacking are, are these. So when we apply these criteria, we go from about 1,000 halos down to 500. 
Um, and it, it's very interesting follow-up work, and we, we're planning on doing this, just studying all of these individually, because we can, we can get very, I mean, there's a lot of interesting physics in, in these systems that we haven't included for the dark matter analysis. Okay, but also a potential non-detected cosmic ray signal would worsen your limits. Sorry? So, so also potential signal from non-related gamma, non-dark matter related gamma rays would worsen your limit if you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. it certainly would. I mean, and, and um, yeah, I mean, you, you can, we see it, uh, yeah, I mean, we see it here. There, there's, there's structure here, right? Like, you know, we even get this little, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if this is anything like what you're referring to, but we su do see that there's a lot of structure there, and if it's something that's not a significant excess that's excluded by everything else, it would be included in the stacking, um, and it would worsen our limit. And, yeah, there's nothing we can okay, do about thanks. that. Are there any, I see one question here in the front. Thanks for a great, great, great talk. So all, those, all of these analyses assumes uh, S-wave, like uh, annihilation, is that right? Uh, like yeah, yeah, I mean, these are just the, the simplest, I mean, the, the limits that we're setting here are just on uh, cross-section and mass for the simplest possible cases, yeah. Because w we learned from Kim yesterday that uh, if you have some velocity dependence, the J factor can be drastically affected. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So the, the J factors that we've calculated here are just assuming that you have an NFW right. profile. But you can essentially redo this whole exercise um, for different profiles, making different assumptions. Like if you have some velocity dependence in the, uh, the cross-section, you would have to recalculate the J factor and then redo the analysis. But that's all. Th that's does not it feasible. change the result? a lot or you have to do it to know? Um, so I can't comment on um, including things like Sommerfeld right. enhancement. I can show you, um, you know, we've tried things like varying the dark matter profile. Mm. Um, I will, here it is. So here are some, uh, the black line is our, just the standard limit I've already showed you. And then these variations here are doing things like changing the, the halo concentration or going to a core profile. And so you can see that the, the limit does change a bit, but it, it doesn't change dramatically. I see. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank Mary Angela again.